And now, the host of Quirks of Israel, Reverend Peter Fast. <sighs> oh. oh, hello everyone. Uh, you, you ever get that, like, where you got an itch that you can't reach? You know? Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, right there. Okay, thank you. Boy, you never thought the cameraman could do that, hey? Oh, thank you. Good to see you all. Welcome. Good to see you. Episode 20. We made it. We are getting closer and closer to the finish line. This is just excellent. Good to see you. Afterwards, Eric will be uh, relieving anybody of any itches that they cannot reach. Okay. All right, welcome. Welcome to episode 20 of the Quirks of Israel. That deserves an applause, I think. Episode 20. Today's episode is called Experiencing the Feasts of the Lord in Israel. Now, one of the delights of Israel as a Christian is experiencing the biblical feasts in the land, or as they're called in the Bible, the feasts of the Lord. Leviticus 23 verse 2 says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be a holy convocation, these are my feasts. The Bible doesn't refer to them as the feasts of Israel or the feasts of the Jews, but as the feasts of the Lord. Israel was commanded to observe them, to celebrate them, to honor them, and meet with God during a specific appointed time, or a moed in Hebrew. But ultimately, these were God's feasts, the time where God wanted to meet with his people. Leviticus is an incredibly rich book that outlines how the Israelites were to worship God, what was expected of them to be in relationship with God, how they were to function in community, the importance of God's holiness, and how to approach a holy God. Leviticus is such an incredible book, often overlooked by so many Christians, yet it is essential in understanding the holiness of who God is. Leviticus 23 outlines the appointed times or the feasts of the Lord, which have been celebrated on the Hebrew calendar by Jews in the land of Israel and around the world for thousands of years. Understanding the feasts opens up the richness of God, His Word, and our relationship with Him shines through. They are a treasure trove of wealth. Understanding the feasts of the Lord also helps illuminate many of the passages we Christians encounter in the Newer Testament, as Jesus, His disciples, and the early believers in Jesus were all Jews and continued celebrating the feasts, worshiping in the temple, and maintaining their lives as Jews. Are you a Christian and skeptical about the feasts and what they mean because you've never considered them? Well, I want to walk you through a year in Israel. I trust by the end of this show, you will consider honoring the feasts and seeing them as central in God's plan and relevant. At least unpacking the feasts of the Lord through your Bible study can be an incredibly rewarding endeavor because I believe it draws us closer to God's heart. So, you may have read about the Last Supper. That was Jesus celebrating Passover with his disciples. You may have read in John chapter 10, verse 22, about the Feast of Dedication. Although not a Levitical mandated feast, that was Jesus celebrating Hanukkah at the temple in Jerusalem. Or you may have read the words in John chapter 7, 37. On the last great day, that great day of the feast. Well... That was Jesus celebrating the water ritual during the final day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot in Hebrew, where the final day was called, and still is, Hoshana Rabbah, the Great Day. One more. You may have read about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the new believers in Jesus while they listened to Peter's sermon at the southern steps of the temple in Acts 2. You may have heard that strange and wonderful word, Pentecost. Well, Pentecost is Greek, meaning 50 days, and 50 days after Passover is the spring feast of Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks. So when Peter preached his sermon, that was during Shavuot. Okay, let's hear it for Shavuot. Okay. As a side note, you can read all about the feasts in our Bridges for Peace book, 
Israel and the Church, God's Roadmap, in chapter 3, entitled, A Year in the Life of Israel. Okay, let's do this. In the early spring, usually in the month of March, but on the Hebrew calendar, the 14th day of Adar, you have Purim, the Feast of Esther. Jewish people all over the world read the Megillah, which is the story of Esther. They cheer, woo, for Mordecai and boo, boo, for Haman, as they reflect the preservation of the Jewish people from the evil plots of Haman to wipe out all the Jews of Persia. Traditionally, this is a big celebration day too. So Jewish people eat cookies called Haman's ears. I mean, just Google it. And they dress up in wonderful costumes from princesses to Spider-Man to doctors, pirates, even robots. Next on the seven days of the Hebrew month of Nisan, from the 14th to the 21st, which usually falls in April, we have one of the major feasts of Pesach, or Passover. This was one of three major feasts outlined in the Bible, where all Jewish men of Israel were expected to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to observe. Passover recalls the Israelites in bondage in Egypt and, the go and God rescuing the people from the clutches of Pharaoh as his servant Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt to Mount Sinai. The Feast of Unleavened Bread recalls the flat matzah that was made without yeast and the Passover is when the angel of death passed over the homes of the Israelites who were commanded to put blood on the doorposts and mantles of their dwellings Yet where the blood was not found, the death of the firstborn of Egypt. Naturally, this tenth plague smote the firstborn of Egypt from Pharaoh's house to the common servant, even the animals. And this came after nine other plagues, which you can read about in your Bibles or Google as well, although the Bible definitely first. For thousands of years, Passover has been observed by Jewish families with a special feast, the Seder, which means order and special foods are eaten as well as prayers, liturgy, songs, and questions, and the recounting of the Exodus story. For the 50 days, or seven weeks, following Passover, we have counting the Omer. And Omer was a measure of grain. During this time of counting, Jews will speak a blessing each day to thank God for His provisions. Then we arrive at Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, along with a couple other names. This festival... The second major pilgrimage, Feast of Three, is the celebration of the wheat harvest and usually occurs around May. The Jewish people also celebrate the giving of the Torah, uh, God's Word, at Mount Sinai. It is Shavuot where we get the word Pentecost, which is Greek for 50. Next is Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, which occurs in the fall and is also called the Feast of Trumpets. It is the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, marks the beginning of the holiest time of the year. Ram's horns are blown across the country and a 10-day period is ushered in called the Days of Awe, which is a time for introspection where people search their souls, make things right between themselves and God as well as their fellow man. Jewish people also celebrate with special foods such as apples dipped in honey or anything sweet for that matter, which represents fruitfulness and prosperity. They also eat round foods, such as a round loaf of bread, which is symbolic to the new cycle of the year. After the 10 days of awe comes Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. This is the most holy day of the year and has been since the time of Moses. In biblical times, the nation would come together to repent for their sins, afflict themselves and fast. Two goats would be presented and the high priest would choose through a lottery believed to be guided by the hand of God, which goat would die for the nation and which goat, the Azazel or the scapegoat, would be led into the wilderness to die, representing the transgressions of the nation. This was also the day where the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and later the temple. When he would emerge, the people would break the fast in celebration, knowing God had forgiven their sins. Today there is no temple, but Jewish people fill the synagogues of Israel and around the world. They will study the Torah, in particular the book of Jonah. They will often wear white as a symbol of purity. They will fast from food and water and pray for restoration. In Israel, 
the Kotel or Western Wall, will be filled with worshippers crying out to God throughout the day until Yom Kippur comes to an end and then they will break the fast with a celebration. During this solemn day for 24, 25 hours, the streets will be empty and the cities and communities quiet. Nearly 80% of the nation will observe Yom Kippur and it is a moving experience to search one's soul to spend the day in Bible study and prayer and then walk to the Kotel with thousands of people for the day's conclusion. Yom Kippur is a refreshing day because it reveals the faithfulness of God and His compassion and steadfast love to forgive us and restore us unto Himself. All right, two more feasts to go. Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles, is the season of our joy. It recounts how God provided for the Israelites in the wilderness after the Exodus and how God tabernacled among them. The word sukkah means booth, and so Sukkot is the festival of booths. Today, Jewish people will construct a flimsy structure in which they will decorate, sleep in, eat in, and have guests or ushpazin come over for a visit. They will cover the roof with palm fronds, but not completely so they can see the stars. Sukkot was the third and final pilgrimage holiday, which coincides with the fruit harvest. Sukkot happens in the fall, usually September, October, and is celebrated for seven days. Scripture commanded the Israelite to bring certain vegetation and fruit as an offering. This is the lulav, which is a palm frond, a willow branch, myrtle branch, and an etrog, which is kind of like a, a fruit that looks like a lemon. Google the traditional significance of the lulavim, okay, because it's beautiful. Worshippers will hold these four species, the lulavim, together and wave them before the Lord as they recite prayers and congregate. Once again, to be in Jerusalem during Sukkot is amazing. To witness thousands of Jewish men and women at the Kotel will never leave your mind. Even the prophet Zechariah in chapter 14 in his prophecy during the Messianic era to come writes that Gentiles from all over the world will come up to Jerusalem to worship the King Messiah and they will bring gifts for the Feast of Tabernacles. The day after Sukkot, or the eighth day, is Simcha Torah, which is the celebration of the Torah. On this day, the readings of Torah, so Genesis to Deuteronomy, are completed, and everyone celebrates. The next day restarts the weekly Torah portion all over again with Genesis chapter 1. But on Simcha Torah, synagogue congregations will celebrate by dancing with the Torah scrolls, and often these parties will spill out into the streets. A sight to see. Okay. Finally, we have Hanukkah, the festival of lights. This is not a Levitical feast, but it gives glory to God for the preservation of the Jewish people and their faith in surviving the cruel persecution from the corrupt Seleucid king Antiochus Epiphanes IV during the second century BCE. Okay. With a series of major battles fought by the Jewish Maccabees against the Seleucids, they would eventually gain their freedom. All right. And lead to over a century of Jewish independence and sovereign rule until Rome arrived and conquered the land and kind of ruined things. All right. Okay. The miracle of the Maccabees victories, they are incredible. And yet the major miracle was the lighting of the menorah or lampstand in the temple when Jerusalem was recaptured by the Maccabees. The story recounts that only enough olive oil was found to light the menorah for one day, even though the sacred fire was to burn constantly because it represents God's presence. So despite not having enough oil, they lit the menorah in faith and it miraculously burned for eight days, giving them enough time to produce more oil, consecrate it, and refill the menorah. Okay. <laughs> Jewish people all around the world will eat all kinds of foods cooked in oil, such as jelly donuts and latkes in remembrance of the miracle of oil. Each family or individual also will light a nine-branch lampstand, or Hanukkiah, to commemorate the eight days of Hanukkah, with the ninth candle being the servant candle that lights the rest. 
Walking through the Jewish quarter of the old city in Jerusalem at night during Hanukkah is a wonderful treat as flames glow from all the Hanukkahs burning in the windows or porches of every Jewish home, causing the stones to glow with a golden color. My personal favorite time of year, Israel is quirky. Join me on episode 21 of the Quirks of Israel as I bring to you wacky yet practical creations, Israel's innovation. Cheers and shalom.